Thank you, Jamie and the rest of the team for pulling this together and allowing us to be able to present to the participants out here to talk a little bit about what we do, one, just at NC State and trying to look at what is going on across the spectrum in the business around forestry and as we do recruitment, retention and inclusion, but also creating the environment that focus on the student versus focusing on what we're just trying to do and increase numbers. So with that, I'll ask Tremaine to proceed. You got this already, so no reason to say it again. <laughs> So we start with a set of fundamental beliefs. As we all know, the sector is sorely lacking in gender, racial, and ethnic diversity. I've been in the business over 40 years, and I can barely count the number of individuals, especially racial, that as far as African-Americans or minorities that come into the forestry and natural resource space, more centered around environmental science, sports management, and you'll hear a little, little bit about that as we dig deeper into what's going on at NC State. But just thinking about the sector as a whole, uh, we do lack the representation as it relates to minorities. It's been a well-documented and material benefits that says organizations that are more diverse, they experience better member engagement. Uh, they help in making better decisions because we're dealing with a lot of different cultures. We're dealing with a lot of different people, spaces, and places. So we need people that reflect the environment and which makes us more resilient and durable and then more likely to achieve the organizational objectives. So if we have more voices at the table, voices in the room, most likely we can make decisions that impact the whole. We provide it to protect, provide solutions to the global economic, environmental and social challenges. When we think about forestry and other natural resource type operations, we're not just talking about the South. We're not talking about the North and Northeast, Northwest, nor are we talking about the Midwest. We're talking global now because we do this work all across the world. A lot of the individuals I deal with, not only do they work in the South, but they work in many different sectors across the US and across the international waters. So we have to look at people that reflect that environment and get them on our teams. Next slide, please. So I know this from growing up, that there are long standing barriers to entry that impacts the interests and considerations of natural resource related careers. Just growing up myself, I grew up in a household that no one sat around the table talking about forestry. Uh, I didn't go out in the woods to see foresters to understand what they do. But most importantly, when we talk about trying to help students understand what it means to get into this field, we got to include the parents because most parents that look like me, they spend time talking to their kids about being a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. We reverse that mindset in the recruiting world by telling them you can be all three of those things if you can consider yourself coming into one forestry spectrum that says, we can help you be a doctor as it relates to biologists, a biology working on trees and plants and animals. We can also look at engineering. We hire forest engineer, engineers to work our road systems, to work for different companies, work for USDA, and think about things in hydrology. We talk to them in ways that they can reflect the career that looks like what they've been taught. So as we reach out and express myself talking to the families and talking to the kids, one of my ultimate, the ultimate goal with them is helping them to see that here's the job market as it relates to what you're going to school with, and we tie the loop that way. So the need to increase the sector diversity is not a new condition. We've been talking about this. I know when I started in 1979, this was on the table. I actually got started at Tuskegee University where the USDA Forest Service decided they wanted to increase diversity. So they came into the historically black universities. They set up programs that allowed students to one, get received scholarships from high school into the first two to four years while attending school at Tuskegee. You had a choice. You can stay at that school and finish your degree, but they scholarship the first two years and then they provide an intern every summer. It allowed me when I went through the program to go out and work for the Forest Service on the West Coast. I learned how to fight fire, learn what fire management meant. I also learned what it meant to practice forestry from a landscape scale. Critically though, one of the things that it taught me was 
I can get out of the South. I can move around and I can see different things. I can see different people. It helped me to understand that everyone that I grew up with didn't look like me, nor were the same two groups of people that was growing up in my space in Alabama. But it helps us to look at this sector and figure out ways that we can engage people, especially more minority employees, because I'm working on a project now for the U.S. Endowment that says, how do we get more consultants in the business that are minorities? I said, we have a bigger challenge, which is building the pipeline up from high school to college to get them in forestry degrees. And in order to do that, we have to specialize in certain programs that help kids understand when they get into high school, here is the career path associated with the work of being a forester. And also what are the opportunities for you when, when, you, when you get out? We're able to place all of our students, not only African-Americans, but any student right now that come out in forestry. We just about have 100% in pl placement as long as a person wants to get a degree in that field. But the efforts to date has been largely independent in nature. So it's been silos of people out here working on this. We have a big movement now that's trying to look at some consortiums with other with the other universities. How do they help them get a pipeline built up? How do we get them placed in the school land grant universities across the South that we can increase the minority population and spend time nurturing them while they're in that career, but also not putting them alone in places where they're working by themselves and not feeling comfortable or safe. So there's a lot of work, I feel, since in the last two years, especially with COVID, has given us, given us enough time to really think through the efforts that are missing and what points we need to make and what solutions we need to put in front of the, the organizations that are reaching out to say, we want to make this happen and make it successful. Next slide. So we just talked about convening structures. We're trying to build that now. We're working with different industry level people Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service, all the entities that have been coming to us and especially myself saying, how do we increase this sector with more diverse candidates? So uh, finally, and I think with others, we got people listening. Like this slide deck, uh, I worked on this with uh, the CEO of Resource Management Services. They provide scholarships to students at many land grant universities just to impact diversity within their company. But not only if they're, they're not only trying to hire these individuals within their company, they understand that not every student that show up and graduate from one of these colleges are going to work for them. But they believe in this, that they are willing to invest not only here at NC State, but other land grant universities in this field to help them see that there's a need to increase this across the pipeline. Next slide. So if we look at the current state of play, the U.S. population, as we look at the gender, is 50.8%, female is 49.2%, the females, race, 60%, white, 13.4%, blacks are 26.5%, other, I mean, other minorities, two-thirds are women and, and or minorities. As we look at the Society of American Foresters members, the gender is 11%, female is 89% male, race, 95% white, 1% Black and 4% other minority. Now we look at university enrollment in forestry just based on 2017 data and make up 23% female and 77% male. As we look at it by race, 89% white, 1% Black, 10% minority. Not much movement between what is going on at the university as compared to SAF. Next slide. So there's a case for increasing diversity, the benefits to increase diversity in the profession. There's great opportunities today for working for us, significant challenges as well. The more people we get into the space, the more opportunities that we can help our youth know what this field is all about. But we also look at the landscape of the landowners, the private landowners across the South, and especially in the South. The ratio of more minorities owning land and being engaged in the management of their land now is increasing significantly. And so we need to get faces out there on the landscape that help them see that there are other people that can help them, which I think will also help increase more minorities getting into this space as well. Uh, it's also influence of our success by increasing more individuals working in this space. It will help us long-term look at a way that how do we cre increase more dialogue with problem solving and conflict resolution to demonstrate that diversity is important to the field of what we're trying to operate in. And as we look at more diverse and more dialogue and con conflict resolution issues, diversity will enable that good, rich conversation to help make change to, to the future. 
So what's the business case? As you see, two thirds of the US population is not white male. So more color, more minorities, more in that space helps to increase the business case for making it successful. The current model, it restricts access to two thirds of the smartest, most creative, hardworking individuals. So we literally have a failed model that we need to look at ways and systems to in, improve that. Greater diversity, the organization with better engagement that makes better decisions and have greater success. We see that just in the work and the change that has happened here just within our university. We have a lot more diverse populations of staff, faculty. And as I look around, the, even just within our college, into our college now, the increase of diversity is rich, it's getting better, but people are conversating on other ways to improve this field to help other people get into it. So what are some barriers? Education, one is the lack of awareness. We have a very negative environment of view. People see this as not a good job. So we have to change the language around what it means to get in this field. But most importantly, demonstrate to kids that it's not all about just working in the field and all dirt type positions. Uh, they see low skills. So typically it's not seen as a status. So people, especially parents, when we talk about where they try to push their kids, they don't see our work as a profession. So we got to make sure we as foresters continue to promote what we do in the professionalism behind it. So the outdoor experience is the common interest. As you all know, to get in forestry, most kids don't, want, don't feel safe in the woods. Their parents are pushing them away because they were not safe. Grandparents push them away because we think about the migration to the north. We lost a lot of people of color that went north but never wanted to come back. Now we have an influx of people coming back to manage their land, to take over where their parents left off. And we need to get kids in the role that helps them to see that there's an opportunity. We do know that this is a well-dominated field of white male and there's so there's a lack of role models that exist. So one of my efforts along with building up the pipeline is we're building out a business case for other minorities that's working in this space in any role to help give back, help mentor students when they get to the positions of, in college and to help provide an opportunity for them to come out and work with them or be mentored by them throughout their career. So the recruitment practices, it's been the old status quo. We provide a dollar or a little scholarship funds. We don't spend much time trying to build the case from what I call element K through 12. And we spend less more time thinking about if I provide a scholarship that should increase minorities. I call that a fail system for sure. It's difficult to give a scholarship if you don't have the student. So if we don't build up the number of students that need to come through the field, providing scholarship dollars is a waste. We'll take it, but we still need to be able to build up the pipeline of students coming through, getting into high school, coming out of high school and accepting a role in one of these land grant institutions to get a career in the forestry sector. With that, I'll pass it on to Tremaine. You'll mute, Tremaine. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, we should all be used to that mute button by now. And I am, but it happens from time to time. So um, again, glad to be with you all uh, today and going along with what um, Sam said, as far as thinking about the business case um, and when I'm talking to students or parents, I like to help them see the economic impact because the students are thinking about um, careers and thinking of course about forestry and environmental resources, natural resources, um, People come to college for that college experience, but also to get a career. Um, and at the end of that, parents and students want to say, all right, so what does this mean? What does it look like? And so I like to provide, you know, just a little bit of numbers on what that means maybe here in North Carolina and the Southeast. Um, so even thinking about that North Carolina, more than half of it is Timberland and um, the viability of a career um, in forestry and how this is something that is ongoing and forestry um, and land management is necessary for a lot of the packaging uh, materials that we have. It's necessary for, you know, clean air and clean water and sharing um, the importance of that um, with students and connecting that to the science and the STEM fields where 
as Sam said, a lot of students and parents, of course, um, sit down and talk about being a doctor or a lawyer, or sometimes even um, a research scientist. And all of those things are, uh, those subject matters are so relative to the information that is necessary um, for forestry. Sam hit on this a, a lot about the challenges with diversity and inclusion um, in the pipeline of uh, students and also professionals. And uh, one of uh, some of my recommendations are um, you have to begin the exposure early. Um, all of us are quickly exposed to a doctor because we start going from the time that we are born. Um, but really thinking about what are we doing, um, all of us, and providing information about um, forestry um, to students very early during school and sharing that information, of course, along with their parents. And it can be in schools or it can be through community organizations um, as well. It doesn't always have to be in school. And as uh, Sam said, including parents and family. As someone who works with students who are transitioning or looking to apply to college, a lot of what I hear, um, the parents are a big part of that decision. Family members are a big part of that decision of not only where a student goes to college, but what they select uh, for a career. And so it can't be a silo where it's only that information is geared towards students. It also has to be there for parents and family. And a lot of times with community organizations or community events, you are able to have parents, family members, and also um, the student. I think it's important of talking about um, finding out students' interest and how those can translate to um, forestry, because a lot of it could, as Sam talked about the bio biology, if we talk about chemistry, sometimes the outside piece is there for students. You know, maybe they have um, not been encouraged to be in forest land or in the woods, but they enjoy being outside or working outside or um, working with their hands and not sitting in an office. And so I think when you get to those interests and share more of the, the options and possibilities, um, that will help. And one of my other things with the challenges with diversity and inclusion um, in this field and also other fields as well is, and Sam mentioned this too, is when we, you know, put in, um, you know, pipelines and initiatives to bring um, underrepresented groups, uh, more of them into an environment that doesn't look like them, that means that that environment should feel welcome. It should have inclusive practices. Um, and that's what I see a lot is there's a lot of work that is put into, all right, let's recruit, 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 and do what we can um, to diversify the population. But then when um, underrepresented groups arrive, um, they don't stay, not because it's not something they wanna do, but because the environment is not welcoming, um, it's not inclusive, the practices are not inclusive. So that's something to also think about too, is as we work to diversify this group, what are we doing on the other end so that the environment is well? And when I speak of the environment, I mean, not just our practices, but also the people that make up the culture of an organization. And I think while we are um, providing awareness and recruiting, at the same time, the organization has to think about what they're training their employees to do and understand um, and provide that type of environment. I wanted to share as, um, you know, to help you as you talk with students and parents about careers in forestry, just some of the resources that we have um, throughout North Carolina and also at NC State. I um, grew up as a first generation college student. And so there are a lot of things that my family didn't know or think about um, as far as exploration. So I always encourage no matter first generation or not, there are so many resources in a university for students who are elementary, middle, and also high school to explore um, careers and opportunities. Some of these I've lists, of course, are not just specific to forestry, but of course can lead there. Um, and so as you're speaking with your friends and also other colleagues or you're out in the community, um, I encourage you to share this information and how students can come and spend their summer programs that the university offers. Some of those are at a cost and some of those are at a low cost or no cost. Um, Sam and I are working on an initiative to try to do something like that with natural resources. And um, there's so many ways, um, other ways as well through North Carolina 4-H, Future Farmers of America, those are also in schools. They bring them to NC State to explore. Um, so that's important is that starting the exploration early and that it can start um, at a low cost or also um, no cost as well. 
And in this too, I like to make sure that uh, students think about what courses are going to prepare them um, as they come to college to be a forester um, or to work in natural resources. This is a people business, but it's also a science business. Um, and what I see, you know, not with all students, but a lot of students, the courses that I've listed here, these are not uh, a lot of high school courses that students actually want uh, to take. They may take one or two because they know that that is what they have to do to graduate. Um, and none of this looks all exciting to have all of those on your transcript, and that, and that is true. But um, this is a way that students, one, can um, explore the industry, but also it prepares them before they get to college and it makes them competitive um, on the application. Uh, for example, NC State being, you know, a largely, not solely, but largely a STEM university, um, are looking to see have students taken these classes um, in high school because, or at a community college. Because when you get here, you have to take them. In our forest management program, you're going to have to know um, science and math. Um, and the more prepared you are before you get here, the better and seamless it's going to be. And I, like I said, I know most students are not excited to be like, well, I've already taken chemistry. Why do I need to take physics also? You don't necessarily have to, but it helps you. And the things that you learn as far as the critical thinking, um, the calculations, it's just going to make a seamless transition into the program. And so as you talk with students, it's important to encourage these because I see a lot of students who they are told to take the bare minimum, um, not all students, but the students who go over just a little bit and maybe they take pre-calculus and calculus, they're so much more prepared um, academically uh, when they get to college. And Jamie told me not to make this a recruitment presentation, so I'm not going to focus too much on that. But as we talk about um, what we can do to um, increase members in this industry, I had to, you know, let you all know how that can happen um, through attending NC State University. And so I just note that um, our current uh, college here is ranked number four in the nation for um, natural resources and conservation um, for students who are or that you can get interested in this field, we are a great resource and a great place for them to think about uh, continuing their education to make this career. Some of the other things that you can share is that there's a lot of hands-on learning that happens through our programs here at NC State. Our students are well prepared um, to be dynamic um, in the field of forestry. And they also, being here in North Carolina, are able to get the experience of a variety of environments. Um, you know, the forest that you see here in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, and that environment is going to be different than what you see on East Coast of North Carolina and also in the mountains. One of our programs um, for students in these two majors is a summer camp that they do before they um, are a senior in the program, and they spend four to six weeks in the summer. It's required everybody has to do it, experiencing those various environments um, so that they are well prepared to go out in the industry. We have um, forests throughout the state of North Carolina, our college does, but also here in Raleigh, um, that our students are able to experience and identify, have classes there. Um, so again, providing that opportunity of not sitting in the classroom all the time and really getting the preparation inside and outside of the classroom. I'll also share about another resource that our university has um, for students who um, come into our program is to spend some time in Moorhead City um, as a part of the summer camp, but they can also do a semester there. Um, Coming into this program, it's hands-on learning, access to industry experts, especially for those people um, exactly like Sam Cook, but a real opportunity um, for them to be uh, some of the best that go into that industry. I don't want to talk and share too much about the admissions process. I can. I'll um, have questions there um, as you are talking to students about how to become a forester and us being an option. Um, but I think it's important to know in order to increase who's in the pipeline, they have to know how to navigate the higher education system. Um, for those who are applying from high school, it is very important that they apply by November 1st because that is the only way they can be considered for university-wide scholarships. Um, and sometimes students will say, well, I'm not competitive for, um, you know, that November 1st deadline because it is a little bit more competitive. But the thing is, it doesn't matter because if you don't apply by then, you're not considered in that pool for scholarship monies. 
things that the university will look for um, is that students are taking um, challenging courses in their school and they're getting good grades. Uh, the piece to that is when you apply to a university, we all know, they're not looking at your senior year GPA. They're looking at your GPA from your freshman year, sophomore year, and junior year. Um, and sometimes students think about um, things you know, later on in that process, and it sometimes academically at that point um, could be too late, and I'll talk about another option. But as you talk with students and parents, um, encourage them to look at what are the challenging courses in the school to take because that increases your GPA. And a lot of times there are challenges with that, and if parents and family members are not um, advocating for that, it doesn't happen for all students. As Sam started out talking about some of the barriers um, that our students may face um, getting to these careers is, you know, sometimes the education system and it takes um, advocation there for them to get in some of those classes. Um, and it is important, again, for students that have leadership skills outside of school as well. I mentioned that you know, coming in as a first year student and, you know, the GPA options there. But I also like for people to know when they're encouraging students to come into our program is that not everyone starts in the program straight out of high school. A third of our students are transfer students that have come from um, a community college or another university program. And we actually um, have a program here in our college called the Dill Earnhardt Legacy Program, uh, specifically for those uh, majors um, and careers that are gonna be in the field and outdoors. And this is for students who, for whatever reason, it could be financial, it could be maybe needing to stay closer to home, let me go back, um, and they can spend one year at a community college um, taking courses, being supported by us and guided by us, um, and then they have an opportunity for another way into the university. So I wanted to make sure you're aware of that opportunity as you talk with students because, you know, maybe sometimes students don't think about this until they're junior or senior um, and maybe they are not competitive at that point. Um, and sometimes what happens too is maybe where they are in high school is just not the best environment for them. But I think what happens with students there, especially if you're talking with them and they're interested in forestry, is they may think that there's no other option beyond high school. And there is. And we have programs like this so that students know that there are other options because we do need these various pipelines to um, increase the industry. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. I think that is all that we have as far as the official presentation. Um, and we are happy and have time to answer questions um, and address any other things that you'd like to know more about. Well, thanks, Tremaine. Uh, let's see. Um, if you want to stop sharing the screen. Um, so I, I was listening in um, this, this is a, a somewhat analogous, but not, not directly so. So a couple of years ago, I went back to my alma mater and, and organized a panel of uh, graduates, it, who folks who've gotten history degrees, but did not go into teaching because parents have this concept that if you get a degree in history, the only thing you can do is teach. So we had a, we had the, uh, like a 90 minute conversation with students about here are career options. And we encourage them to go back to their parents and, and talk with them more openly about, you know, teaching is not for me, please, but I love history. So how would you uh, encourage students, be it high school or early in their uh, college careers, whose parents don't understand or don't appreciate or don't really even know what land management, natural resources, how would you uh, advise students to talk to parents and then I'll broaden, kind of flip it around and how would you encourage people who are, um, how would you encourage employers or potential employers to talk with, with families and parents? So it's kind of two, two separate questions, but um, some, some basic advice that I think would be really helpful here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of times the first question that I get from parents and then also students is questions about salary. Um, so it is important um, to be transparent about what salary looks like. Um, what salary looks like as an entry level, as in I'm, I'm my first 
you know, year one through year three, but they also want to know, you know, because even if year one th through three or four isn't the best salary, then what will it look like in five years? And what will that look like in eight years? So I think, you know, a lot of times we start with the average starting salary is this, which is fine and transparent to do, um, but it's important to say that's the starting salary. And as you have gotten more experience and you get experience here and there, then your options are, it could be to go into management or be this type of consultant, or you can go in research. So you have to show the broad opportunities and not just, you start as, you know, in the US Forest Service here at this entry level position, that's what you make. Well, explain like what happens beyond that. And then what does the growth look like? I think, I mean, that's typically what I share and what's important for them to see um, as well. And that, like you said, Jamie, with the options, it, it's not just that one option. Also, students, you know, want to know and parents, all right, if I get out there, you know, in the first three years and I don't like it, this, then am I stuck? And you have to be prepared to have that discussion about what could be next and those transferable skills. And I don't know. I feel like there's another question there. Let's see. Let me jump there's in. another add-on, um, yeah. Jamie and Jermaine. It's, it would have been a hard question to really respond to few years back, but I've been working with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative in conjunction with Project Learning Tree. They've created this manual. It's called the Forest Literacy Framework, mm -hmm. and it's designed for K through 12, but it's also designed that parents and others in the community can read it, walk people through it, and help them understand the benefits of what this career has to offer. So I think there's a lot of tools out there that we need to be sharing with people that we haven't been sharing on things that have been created but we got to get it out into the, to the works, into the spaces, mm -hmm. inclusive of schools. But the, f the financial piece is a key aspect of it because no matter who I talk to as a student and the first question from the parent when I'm with them is how much money will they make and will they be safe? And, and safety is not a small consideration. And, and there's safety on the job, but safety in the community. And I've had conversations with African-American foresters. Melody Mobley is a, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a real good example or almost a case study, but she's talked very frankly about problems she's encountered, but I've spoken with others who, you know, they, they are hired by a company and sent to a small community that's almost exclusively white and there are cultural hurdles to overcome. So there are those safety considerations, but just on the job safety, um, because if there's a disconnect with the family between themselves and anything having to do with activity on the land, um, it, it's if they don't understand that, you know, well, no, you're going to be, you're as an employee, you're going to go through all these safety courses. And the, the education, part of the education process is knowing how to identify poisonous plants or poisonous animals while you're in the woods. Uh, there's that per, you know, personal safety at that level too. So I suppose those are uh, questions that could come up and in, in considerations to, to talk through. Um, a perfect example of that, Jamie, as I, when I helped the Center for Air Structure Preservation build out the forestry program within their organization, part of the recruitment structure was recruiting landowners to be part of a pilot study for the next two years to support whether the framework would work. What was interesting, I had a pretty diverse group of landowners, as young as probably 25 to 30, as old as up to 75 and 80. I had one male that I met who I never thought would even enter into the program, but he was probably my most faithful one. He showed up at every class. We had one a month for him to participate in. If it wasn't a class and it was something else going on, he would be there. But I kept noticing a pattern about him. He would go visit everywhere we needed to meet first without, go and then he would come back to the class. So one day he came to have lunch because we were meeting at a place near Charleston that he wanted to go see. It was on the waterway, Pentecostal waterway. So we got down to the intercoastal waterway. We had to go down a long dirt road. We came back when it had lunch on the way back from the office. He says, I'm glad I came and you went with me. 
if I had showed up and had to go down that road, I never would have went down there and I would, that would have been the first class to miss. So it's the fear of the unknown because of what happened in his past. And so all that is carried on to the parents. Yeah, and, it, and that to, that kind of trauma can be inter, or multi-generational as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have some questions coming in through the, the Q&A forum. And, and uh, just a reminder to use the Q&A forum, not the chat uh, forum when submitting. So uh, we have an anonymous attendee who, want, who asks, can you give a specific example of an effort by universities, industry, and government during the last four decades aimed at encouraging more diversity in forestry programs? And can you discuss why or why not they have failed or succeeded? Do we keep trying the same things with the same results? <laughs> <laughs> and Lauren says she oh, would- oh, Lauren's just simply flagging that for us to, oh. to answer. This is how we, <laughs> yeah. that's okay. This is how we keep track of it. Um, so Lauren's just flagging that I'm asking you uh, if you can provide specific examples from universities, industry, and government over the last, we'll just say half century, at encouraging more diversity in forestry programs. So I, I do think you, you brought one up, uh, the Tuskegee program. Yeah, and um, I saw my colleague, Mac Hogan. Is he, you still out there, Mac? We'll, we'll look for Mac. <laughs> so one example would be what is what happened at Tuskegee. They started with an aggressive recruitment strategy. They provided funds to support the students. They placed them in jobs across the U.S. But what happened with the program, we found a lot of people getting into the field of forestry. They were being placed in different places but then a lot of people also didn't stay because they didn't feel accepted or they entered into the program early on in their career and they went to some place and it was no one that looked like them. They didn't have a community around them that could support either whether where they want to go to church or their religion or faith or whatever. But the biggest thing that I noticed, and I can give credit to the Forest Service for increasing the pipeline, but where I think things have fell off is retention. And we tend to see that not only in the Forest Service, but in many other industry sectors where they may have started with a good program built on it, but that retention problem issue steps into play and no one's been able to work on that and figuring out a way to do that. And that I know that's an issue also with uh, retaining women, regardless yes. of of race. Um, but I also say this, Jamie, when you think about, we started talking about increasing diversity in with women and minorities around the same time. Mm -hmm. What I what I have noticed, and it didn't dawn on me until, until a few, about a one, one or two years ago, we did a very good job of recruiting women. We couldn't retain, retain them. But where did we fail in bringing minorities on at the same time? It, it's off it's, it's if we didn't make the same commitment in the minority population as we did with women. Is that something you can uh, elaborate on? It, it's just it's me looking at it from what from I call it the view of my world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see a, we we recruited a lot of females into this field. They also got recruited and put in leadership positions. What I did not see is the amount of individual leaders that got in positions in the minority fields as it relates, to, as it compares to the female sector. Okay. Yeah. Well, along those, I think following up on that is a question from another, uh, another person who says, <clears throat> um, you know, the many outside factors contribute to the lack of increasing diversity in forestry programs. But if funding was not an issue, what would be the one thing you would implement to increase diversity? So you take, take you funding out of, the, out of the equation. That's, um, Jermaine? <laughs> <laughs> if funding was not an issue. So let's just say student gets a, a free ride 
Mm-hmm. Um, so they don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. What what can we be talking to potential students about um, that would might help increase diversity? Well, um, I think it it has to start early. So I mean, like right now, let's say if we had all the funding, I mean, I don't think we'd be able to automatically find someone that could start, you know, next year. Or maybe, I mean, we'd have to travel and do a lot of um, awareness. Um, So I think awareness is important, um, as we talked about, opportunities for them to explore. So if we were able to, if funding was an issue and we were able to get students to want to commit to maybe an exploration program during the academic year or summer um, and taking them to places to get used to being out in the land, but they also need to see people that look like them as well to know that, okay, yeah, this, okay, he does it, she does it, okay, and hear the successful stories, um, I think is gonna be important. And then also the challenges um, piece. I'll go back because even if you if you have the funding as Sam was talking about too, but I see it um, as well. You have the funding to increase diversity. Um, the funding can be on recruitment, but you also have to think about what are you teaching um, the people that are already in your environment so that when those people different for them come, um, it's gonna be an environment in which they want to stay. So you can have the funding to recruit and do all of these creative things that will probably get a lot of, that could get some interest um, and get students to commit and parents to commit. But what happens is then when they get there and they're honestly ran off, um, I think, so I think there also needs to be efforts and funding that go into the education of majority people, um, cultural competence, understanding equity, understanding bias. Um, I think that's a big piece of retention and recruitment. It's a huge one because I'm working with a group now that asked the same question and stated the same thing. And it's a group of us from four different universities that are meeting to try to build out a consortium with five other historically black universities with this idea that if the funding was removed as a barrier, what would it take to increase? The top thing that came up, if your organization is not willing to change on how you receive the students and grow with them and nurture and work with them, it'll fail. You'll spend money and it'll be wasted. The other factor is you got to get people within those schools to help them build up their curriculum Uh so they can be prepared to come to these schools to work in this space of what we teach in forestry and natural resource. So building up people at either the universities, especially up in some of the HBCUs, and what they're preparing them to leave high school with, because they're not all on the same page equally. Uh Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to share a personal story. I don't know if it's appropriate, but as we talk about the diversity piece, um, I've been recruiting um, at NC State involved in recruiting and admissions um, for about 15 years successfully. Um, I've been here in the College of Natural Resources for um, a little over one year. Um, And it was evident to me in my interview process and onboarding that they really wanted me to to institute, you know, strategies I had already used previously at other places to increase diversity um, here in our college. And as I began working on that and speaking of ways to do it, um, after a few months, I had a student um, who works, you know, uh, out in the land in forestry, but a student sent me a long email um, and basically told me that, I was focusing too much on diversity and that if I continued to do so, I was going to alienate the people that populate um, this college um, and bring in money. And I I share that just because as we again talk about recruiting um, and bringing people in and I talk about the educate. So if he says that to me as a person who works here, 
what type of environment are the students um, experiencing? And that's why I said, well, okay, we can put all that money and that effort into the recruitment, but what about also the education and awareness to the people who already make up that environment? So I think that can be, that they're also a big part of recruitment. And in everything that I do for recruitment, we always incorporate current students because they get to share their story and their experience. So you have to have people in your industry and the environment, all types of people that can share their experience and story and share why that environment is a good place to be. And so if you don't have that as well, I personally feel like that's a that's a hindrance. Yeah, if, you, if you're not feeling welcomed or supported, why would you stay? I mean, that's, that's true of any setting, but in, in this one in particular, because it's just, uh, it's like having the door slammed in your face. Uh, Terry Sharik or Sherrick, I'm not sure, at Michigan Tech says, uh, you talked about the importance of a culturally diverse workforce. Is there something unique about the African-American perspective that adds to this diversity, much like the way in which we think about indigenous or Native American perspectives as being unique? Hmm. In ways of knowing, doing, or being. Um, so is there something well, frankly, what is it that somebody like myself is not understanding? Because we, you know, I'm not, I've not had any of the experiences you've had. And, and which I, I, I recognize is a, a three day symposium type theme question, but. Um, well, if you I could, would say this, Jamie and Terry, um, I'll go back to my experience. My daddy worked a paper mill. I had a brother that worked between a sawmill and a chip mill that converted to a chip mill. I had no idea what was going on in either one of those two mills growing up. For the paper mill side of the business, we would go down every summer, have a barbecue luncheon and take a box of paper and bring it home. To this day, my daddy, prior to his death, has never talked about what he did except around a tow motor in that mill. I've never talked about the trees going inside. We did not even know what foresters looked like or existed. I just happened to love the outdoors and the experience. If it wasn't for a mentor who was not even in the forestry sector that kind of took me under his wings to develop me to be this person of going to college, I'd probably still be sitting there working either in that paper mill or working in the sawmill, not having this idea that forestry is a space that we can work into. So understanding where people are coming from, uh, we have a lot of parents that are single parents and they don't have the time to spend with the kids to help them see that there is another opportunity out here. And so we, we need to really go deep enough to say, where are kids coming from that want to be in this profession? And what do we need to do or what support systems we need to build up to help them get there? And as simple as my colleagues that I eventually came to school with here in Tuskegee and NC State when I transferred from Tuskegee, those individuals, they knew what forestry, they knew they wanted to be in forestry from high school. Some of them knew from growing up when they got to understand what it meant to be out in the woods. So that's a piece that's sort of missing in our, our side of the business as being people of color. Okay. Um, Clifford Kipp asks, uh, what role do you see or have you seen for uh, public lands service corporations or conservation corps out type outfits and in increasing inclusivity and diversity? in the federal natural resources workforce. And there's a lot of talk now about this climate change uh, conservation core or something like that. So another civilian conservation core or youth conservation core type uh, entity may come into existence here in the next few years. I see it as uh, probably if we can really endorse and get around that and have others to see the benefits of this, we can take one recruitment to another level. We can also get good sustainable forest management done and we can train a diverse population of students that not all want to be foresters, 
but we're missing a whole pipeline of students to, in just in the trade business. We need the truckers, we need the loggers, mm. equipment operators. That's missing with people in general. In the last two years, I've started a cooperative agreement with Conservation Legacy here in North Carolina and one in South Carolina, utilizing funds from USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services and a few dollars from the Department of Defense. And it's to recruit AmeriCorps volunteers to come in here to work with historically underserved landowners, or underrepresented landowners, to do more forest management on the land with the target of help increasing fire, prescribed fire management on the land. So we started one North Carolina two years ago, and we just entered into a South Carolina agreement, and we're in negotiations with Virginia. If we can prove that out, this would be a model for them to take across not just the South, but across the U.S. And we can build up on that and start bringing more kids that don't have a pathway and provide them an opportunity. Five, four out of the five that we had last year, all four have been placed in a job at the end of their one year assignment. Okay. Uh, Mac Hogan's asks, uh, wildfires and climate change are challenges that have implications for the forestry profession. So that's a good follow-up. Uh, can you say more about how these challenges may motivate people, including people of color, to enter the forestry or natural resources procession, uh, maybe he means profession, to tackle the societal issues? So uh, again, can you say more about how the climate change, wildfires, things like that, what's happening on the land may motivate people to enter the profession and tackle societal issues. I think one is we got to do a better job of educating the people before a lot of these things happen. But also it's, we tend to wait and react. And if we can get a way to get communication out there that's clear, concise, and show people what's happening here versus what's happening in other places, and talk through the real understanding of what, why is it going on that way versus what's happening here. And I'll pick on the West and the South. We had a reporter walk in a room one day, and she was sitting to the side, and it was a brand new landowner, 500 acres of land. And so I was facilitating the group, and I say, tell me, why are you here? First thing he got up and said, I'm here because I wanna make sure we don't have what's going on in California, in Oregon. So I said, you're talking about the forest fires? I said, yeah. So I looked at the reporter because she said, I only have 30 minutes <laughs> to be here today. And I said, here's a noteworthy article for you to write. He just made reference to the fact that we probably do a better job of maintaining and making sure that fires uh, kind of prescribed in a system that we don't have a number of large scale wildfires. And he said, yeah, I wanna make sure we can keep our land, but we don't wanna be burning and losing homes, communities and all. We wanna make sure we can do what we have the right to practice forestry on our land. And I said, it's a good point, but I, I, I think the government's gotta do better in working with communities and finding ways that we can increase more people to be on the landscape boots on the ground, as I call it, talking and working with landowners that are just from small acres to large, talking about the importance of what we have to do to practice forestry on their land. And that will improve climate change. It will help support wildfire, do wildfire mitigation. But most importantly, we want to protect our natural resources as, in, as most people do, but that's one area we have to improve on. They, not, they need to know that our job is to protect the natural resources. It, and I've found in my conversations with foresters over the years I've been here, um, the, they express frustration with the, the general public not knowing what they do and thinking uh, foresters only cut down trees. It's a very simple uh, uh, black and white, you know, foresters are bad, um, environmentalists good, or however that, you know, they just have an oversimplified, but uh, badly flawed understanding of the profession. One of the reasons why our organization did the film about Carl Shank and the Biltmore Forest School was 
it talks about what it meant to be a forester in the early days of the profession. And we've encouraged foresters to take that film and try and go into elementary schools and just show the, the short version and get conversations going with young kids um, about forestry and, and land management and all of that. And I bring that up because I've got a couple of questions uh, relating to or, or dealing with reaching out to the K through 12 uh, population. So Amy Juliana, who is with the North Carolina Forestry Association, and <clears throat> I think their education outreach person, says uh, COVID has completely changed our typical outreach efforts. How have you introduced K through 12 students to the forest and, and encouraged kids to explore forestry as a career pathway when we can no longer even meet in person or conduct hands-on in-person activities? Now this is, yeah, I think this is more than just K through 12, but, um, <laughs> but if you can uh, uh, talk about some of the, both the uh, virtual outreach um, and maybe some of the in-person efforts that uh, NC State and, and other uh, entities have done. They won't let me do outreach, so I turn it over to Jermaine. <laughs> <laughs> you do do outreach. You <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think that we have completely solved the virtual piece, but we have, um, you know, done, we continue to do snail mail. Of course, we don't know if, we don't always know if people are reading it, um, but we, of course, we have email and we utilize it, but we, um, you know, send out cards and brochure information through snail mail, you know, the educators, community organizations, um, students. Uh, we um, have, I I, we do have videos. Um, they're not all on um, forest management, but we have videos of students talking about their experience and it shows them outside. Um, so we share those as well, kind of as information. Um, and we've also helped hosted virtual events and we actually have, and I don't know, I mean, we have on, on the um, university side actually seen more engagement virtually or at least attendance because um, students don't have to, and parents don't have to take a day off from work. They don't have to think about travel, uh, time, travel funds. Um, we've actually also been able to reach, um, you know, people outside of North Carolina um, because, again, they don't have to have a whole three or four day planning to engage with us. Um, so in some ways, um, of course, the virtual environment has helped because we feel like we're able to at least share the message um, with more people. Um, but that's what we've done. I mean, we've just, um, instead of just kind of the lecturing piece, we will hold panels um, and advertise that um, via email with our prospects and also um, our community uh, partners. And that's how we've been continuing to get that story out um, and utilizing oh, the other thing, uh, social media, um, Instagram. We don't have um, TikTok or Snapchat at the university side. Um, hopefully we'll get there because that's where the audience is. But we also, you know, post um, short stories and pictures um, on our social media and try and get uh, students and parents to follow our um, social media as well. Because that's, I mean, people will look at social media before they'll look at an email a lot of times. It, yeah. I, um, well, Sam, you mentioned the, I think it was Sam that mentioned the project learning tree. Yes. Booklet. Yeah. Could you uh, tell us again about that? So I put the link in the chat box to the site that actually give you the framework, forest literacy framework. And hold on a second. It was created to kind of educate K through 12. And they centered around four different themes. What, one is what is a forest? Why do forests matter? How do we sustain our forest? And what are what is our responsibility to forest? And it's topics by grade level and themes. So it builds upon storytelling like in the K through certain level. And then as you get into high school, it gets deeper. And it's designed for people to go in and work with um, the teachers and give them curriculum, but also for people that are needing curriculum that work in community schools or just work with students, that they can use this as a framework to start educating themselves and students on what the, what the forest is for them. 
but I did download the actual framework and put it in the chat box for everyone. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mac McClure has a great question. Um, future forests, no, sorry, future farmers of America organized in urban areas has horticulture as one of their biggest programs. Can we parlay that over into urban suburban forestry initiatives? So some of it's going to where potential students live in, in, a, in a way. Um, but how can we build on, you know, build on these existing models that aren't uh, directly forestry related, such as what they're doing with horticulture? Yeah, I mean, I would say FFA is one of our, I mean, it's one of our largest audiences. So even though they don't spend um, a lot of time talking about forestry, we know that's a group that already has real genuine interest in working with the environment um, and being outdoors. And so that's just the group. I don't want to say we target, but we, you know, we try to go out and talk to their classes during organization meetings, um, making sure they're getting all our information. Um, and we do have a number of students who, you know, and I'm always asking about how did you get interested? Um, they're like, because of FFA. Um, so I think even if they're not focusing on FFA, the forestry piece of it, it's getting in front of the group because they're, they're a captive audience of um, you know, the science and being outdoors and having um, a sustainable impact on the environment. Okay. I um, hope that answered the, the question. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. <laughs> It, it, it answered the question, but one of the issues with FFA, it, like everything else, is not throughout all the high schools anymore. Yeah. So if you are a very rural school and don't have the funding to, to support the program, the yeah. program dies, and where do we want to recruit from? Typically out of rural areas. Mm -hmm. But they never get exposed to it and only get to see it if they show up here in a college or just have to go to an event and someone's talked about FFA. So another way that we can improve is figure out ways to get FFA back in all the schools and bring in the natural resources piece back to that as a way besides just agricultural. Okay, um, I'm being mindful of the time, but we do have a, a couple of more questions if you guys uh, yep. are, are willing. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, somebody asks, um, regarding the learning environment, do you think student body or faculty are a bigger factor in less welcoming environments for underrepresented students? I'm sure this varies from place to place, so I guess I'll ask you to <clears throat> speak from your uh, experiences. Both? It's both are, are, are guilty parties, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't have, you know, it's, not, it's not one or the other. Uh, Mac Hogan's makes a great observation. Uh, the new chief of the US Forest Service is African-American. Um, and, he, and he asks, is that useful to help accelerate your recruitment efforts? In other words, here's, yeah. Somebody at the pinnacle, in, in some eyes, the pinnacle of the profession. And, and um, he has a, a stellar and long, uh, respectful, respectable career. So, yeah, uh, how, yeah, how would this appointment um, help with uh, recruitment? From my perspective, when I see his cabinet, I can give you a better answer because he's only one person and we need to be able, I feel like he can set the stage and if he developed the right people to work with him underneath him and with him, then I see that we can make, make some significant movement in this space. Uh, there's a lot of people trying to get at him because of that reason. And, mm -hmm. and he just got to get grounded and then we have to look because he knows he understands it because it's not where he came from. And I feel like if we can really get grounded with him in that role and get the right people that understand the work and we develop the processes to get it back in place, we can make a significant improvement in this space. 
I, I haven't felt like saying this in a long time, but I see more of a way to make a move now than I've seen in my entire career of being in the business. It makes me wonder what impact um, the, the appointment of Vicki Christensen a few years ago as chief. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, she was not the first female appointed, but she she had a longer tenure than than Gail Kimball. Um, there's, there's probably no way to uh, track the impact of, of her service as chief, um, but it, it would be, I could see where it, it, it is very, it makes it easier to point to uh, the, uh, this person, the, the new chief as, as a role model. And as you know, it's a potential like, okay, look, this, this is a, a pathway. Um, it, it has taken on another level of interest with the younger foresters that I deal with. They see it as an opportunity. And some that I mentor who are in that forest service pathway that they see now that they don't have to stop at one position or not. They see that they can have an opportunity. And yeah, and, and the, I guess the counterpart to that is seeing people who look like you in uh, leadership positions in private industry or in uh, research outfits. I mean, across the board, it's it's that. Um, yeah, the whole sector has to change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I, somebody asked if the, if the new chief, the current chief, uh, is if his background is as if he came up as a forester, and I believe it is. Yes. Um, so, hey, we answered a, a question very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I'm, I'm joking, but we have some tremendous questions and, and um, it, I'm, I'm having a little stymied, like, okay, where, where to go next? But I think I'm gonna finish up with John Dennis. <clears throat> and this brings it back around to where you get, you know, who, who signed your paychecks, which is NC State. So NC State, he says, is a member of the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit Network. Uh, this network has a focus on minority serving institutions and, it's, and these units are a conduit to federal cooperative agreement funds. Units of the National Park Service or Park System often encourage volunteers to work with the parks. These units also often have programs with adjacent high school and elementary schools. Now we're getting to the heart of it. How can we connect these opportunities with students to, to start to develop their interests in STEM? I think I understand the question. I, one, you know, one of my first, uh, thoughts was, um, I say community organizations um, in the area or not in the area. Um, there's so many and I don't know all of them, but um, I've stumbled across some just doing research. Um, but there are, I'll give an example. There's a, it's not here in Raleigh, but there's an organization in Winston-Salem called Crosby Scholars. And their whole, I mean, their main focus is um, getting underrepresented students interested in STEM disciplines and careers. And they are always looking and open for people to come in and share opportunities with their students. Um, there's also the College Advising Corps, which is a national organization and um, pretty heavy here in North Carolina. That's only in high schools, but they are counselors that are put in specific schools and counties across the state that are typically uh, rural, um, maybe low socioeconomic um, in the area. And again, main goal is um, exposing students to um, you know various careers, but also the college, university, and you know other things outside of their regular curriculum that can keep them focused on you know graduating from high school and going to college. Um, that's just that's one example. I mean, or two examples, but. I think key is, is the schools, but not just the schools, but these other organizations that help support students outside of school. Um, and then, you know, things like College Advising Corps, again, we lean on them um, as well, too, to connect with students. And there's another one that I'm, I'm forgetting, but that also has a focus on STEM. 
Okay. So I think we're going to go ahead and start wrapping up because there, what seems to be remaining are a lot of questions. We would be happy to answer via email. Um, some folks asking for resources and things like that. Um, I do want to point out others are saying, you know, retention could improve if uh, we're working to do more mentoring at all different levels. And, and that Gary Schneider, you're absolutely right. Um, it starts with helping students when they walk in the door at college and on up the, all through the career. Um, but what I want to do uh, to finish up is, uh, first of all, thank you both. But I wanted to give you uh, each an opportunity to basically have the last word before I, I have our sign off. So if you have some closing thoughts, uh, Tremaine, I'll start with you. Um, and then, and then Sam. Well, I did see um, there was a question which could be a part of, you know, my last thought about do we have good historical information about the diversity makeup of the field? Um, and I know Sam shared, I think, some data from 2017. I also had looked it up before the presentation. I think that it was 2020 and it was pretty much about the same. Um, and it broke it down by uh, race and gender uh, as well. So I, just, I did want to share that. Um, but last word would be, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it can be done. Um, and it may seem like we can't get there. I think it just, it takes a huge effort. Um, and as I tell people in our college is that if I'm the only one and my team, if we're the only ones that are working to diversify forest management, we're not, it, it can't work that way. We all have to do it. And so I think just keeping, keeping that in mind. Yeah, and for me, I echo what you said, Tremaine, but uh, I, I can look at what little effort we've done since 2016, including bringing you on as well, Tremaine, with the number of faculty members from the dean down throughout the college and staff. We, are, we develop a system that mentoring was a big component of it. And as simple as this morning, I sat down with one of our students that we brought in from Tuskegee one of the first pilots since we opened up the new program. And he sat there and he says, having this many students in the cohort now, they feel good together. They're working on their homework together. They able to get to any faculty to support their efforts. When there's a problem, they know who to call on. And so we didn't, we, we planned to get it, get it to that level. But I know now what we did was the right thing. And so we have to be able to scale up with that type process and start placing more students to get them in here at the same time and work with them along the way throughout the process. So it, not everything is about money, but I feel like what we must do in order to make this change, we need more people thinking in the right direction about how do we make this increase in shift change to get the right person on the bus, as I would call it. And thank well, you for allowing us to do this. Yes, sure. thank you. Well, it, and I'm just thinking about what you said during your portion of the presentation, Sam, which was we're missing out on two thirds of the uh, uh, employee pool. Yeah. Uh, not, not how you phrase it, but that's the reality of it. If mm -hmm. we're, we're ignoring two thirds of the population, then we're leaving a lot of people who could uh, foster change, bring change, think differently, um, bring different perspectives that are absolutely necessary. Um, but ultimately, the, I think the goal really is to have the demographics of the profession reflecting the demographics of the nation. Yes. Because land ownership is going to change. Um, and, but more importantly, we all have a stake in the environment and its future. And we just, frankly, we just want the best and the brightest. And if you're cutting off or denying act yourself access to two thirds of the people or turning two thirds of them away, it's your ultimately, um, it's, a, it's a form of self-sabotage or, or undermining of uh, the environment and our future. We're clearly uh, needing to think differently um, or 
So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but <laughs> we, we, I would just encourage individuals to think about how they have been helping, if whether they have been or not, and to take it upon themselves to start mentoring people, uh, regardless of their position in the profession, whether their first year or 30th year, um, start inviting people to SAF me uh, meetings. Uh, somebody in the, the uh, Q&A said, you know, what about helping people get to SAF meetings, uh, underwriting them? There's just so many opportunities for mentoring and helping um, that we really need to take advantage of and, and push. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll step off the soapbox. But I, again, many thanks to, to Tremaine and to Sam uh, 